Cool. Well, welcome, everybody. Anyone listening to the recording and anyone who might be on live, uh, thanks to everyone for joining uh, today's discussion. I think we had an interesting time in the evolution of Cardano and the blockchain conversation in its entirety. I think there's been a big trend towards the deepen movement. I'm looking at real world applications for blockchain. I think there's nothing more real than real estate, um, you know, the homes that we live in. Uh, and today's panel, I think, will be an interesting one to hear from projects that are building real estate focused solutions using the Cardano technology, understanding a bit more from each of those projects, what ex which niche exactly they're trying to tackle. And then from there, we're going to a moderated discussion where we can delve into more details from um, some questions that have been prepared and maybe some kind of interesting insights from the presentations. So I'm going to avoid taking up too much of the time with the intro. Um, maybe instead of having an introduction from each individual project, maybe you can just do that when it's your opportunity to present. So I think first up is Landano. Great, thanks, Greg. Um, exciting uh, webinar and exciting to see all you guys here and be on a panel with you guys. Um, I know th this group here has been working together in the Kidano space now for um, almost, I would say, two years, right? Uh, so we've been here from the beginning. And um, I think what, a lot what brought all of us together was uh, this idea of like, you know, using the Cardano blockchain and, and blockchain technology to improve land security, land tenure, uh, real estate, access to real estate. So that's, uh, we're starting with our project, Landano. Um, our number one concern is addressing this problem. The fact that uh, land and home insecurity is universal. Um, and the little known fact is that uh, there's around over 5 billion people, 70% uh, of the world's population that actually has legal rights to their land, whether through inheritance or other kind of legal um, legal um, instruments, but they don't actually have a document to prove it. So there's um, amongst amongst that group, there's an estimated billion people world living worldwide daily in the fear of somebody coming to take their land, their shop, their business, because simply because you know in, in a through through violence, through subversion, through other things, uh, simply because they can't uh, produce a, a document demonstrating that their family, their um, that they in fact have uh, ownership rights to the, to the land. So that in and of itself creates a whole cycle of poverty. Um, what we've learned is that in the global north, if you have a tenure, if you, have, if you can prove that you have equity, it opens the door to all kinds of new financial opportunities, starting with mortgages and business loans and so forth. Um, and it is essentially the way that uh, intergenerational family wealth is built. And we're locking out we're locking out 5 billion people from this opportunity. So it's our theory, and it's it's been scientifically studied as well, and it's Landano is essentially a practical implementation of the theory that if you're able to grant land rights, um, you're able to open doors to new financial mobility uh, to formerly unbanked, uh, unfinanced people. And um, what, one of the reasons, I mean, this is not a, this is not a necessarily an, an unknown problem. People have been working on it for quite a long time. Land tenure itself is, is hugely sophisticated and complicated and bureaucratic, as you might imagine. Um, but especially so in countries that are struggling with having more modern bureaucracies, uh, like we tend to come across in the global south. First of all, the systems are difficult to access. Um, they're chaotic, expensive. It's time consuming to deal with the, the people that are uh, that are representatives of that system. There's a lot of disorganized record keeping. Um, so the actual physical documents and, and digital documents, if they exist, are prone to mishandling, mismanagement. Um, lack of security, the systems are very corruptible. We have seen like investment from, um, you know, international organizations to come in and even spend sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars trying to improve land title registry systems for some of these countries, but some of the inherent social uh, issues um, stop it from, from succeeding. And, and quite often they end up becoming heavy white elephant failures. And also part of the reason is that they typically tend to partner with the government and try to fix the whole problem from the top down. Um, and then there has been there have been uh, other projects on other blockchain L1s that have been attempting to uh, add blockchain trust security to land, land registry, um, but those have had its own failures. And 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 as a result, there's now blockchain itself is sometimes seen as a dirty word, uh, NFTs uh, perhaps uh, because of all the controversy we've seen in our space, Web3 space, the last year or two. So that's also not helping the case. Um, but what we're doing with Landano, our project is something different. Um, first and foremost, we try to we want to eliminate all that complexity and make it um, easy for people that are perhaps living in you know in the digital divide, don't have a lot of access to digital tools. Um, creating very very simple, easy to use tools um, that they can use to record and verify their their rights to land. 
And so we're building essentially, you could argue, a type of parallel land registry system. We are not replacing existing legal registry systems. We are enhancing them and making access to them easier and making interacting with those systems easier and creating documents that may not have existed before, creating fully legally compliant, legally um, uh, enabled documents. And the reason we're able to do that is a very unique opportunity we encountered upon uh, our very first round of R&D uh, when we received the Project Catalyst seed funding to go into Ghana. And um, what's happening in these countries, some of these, uh, sorry, I think my coffee timer is going there. Uh, so there are countries in, in Sub-Saharan Africa that received uh, their own colonial independence, uh, created constitutions that recognize the traditional authority of communal leaders, village leaders to um, essentially make decisions on behalf of their communities. And most of those commands and most of those orders are done verbally. Um, and that includes land. And so, what we're doing is we're helping some of these chiefs uh, get a better handle on managing their land, uh, moving it from a verbal to a digital system, um, creating actual records for those for those verbal commands to say, yes, you can have your your family has rights to this plot of land for for leasehold for the next two years. You can buy this plot of land. You can farm here. You have water rights here. These are all the types of things that traditional village leaders are doing around land rights. And they're all dependent on, first of all, proving that somebody holds the land right to a particular plot of land. So what we're doing is uh, we we partnered with a, a, another another project in Mozambique that was already doing this, where Mozambique allows for the same um, the same legal uh, flexibility for communal leaders to make these land allocation decisions. So we're creating a high quality record keeping systems. We've done a huge amount of research into existing standards for land administration systems for the regular Web two Web land administration systems. So we're, we we think we're building a very good land administration system that now also includes Cardano NFTs as trust anchors to remove a lot of the fraud um, and the ability to prove rights. And so what we've done is we, first of all, streamlined the process. So again, if you are somebody in Sub-Saharan Africa that wants to uh, end up at a process where you have a document to prove your, your right to land, you end up going through a variety of, of various steps. And because of this kind of intermingling of like former colonial legal systems and new traditional legal systems, you sometimes have to like interact with both systems at the same time, just making things even more confusing. So, and this is the reason why most of, most people can't afford or have had the time or the ability, the knowledge to go through with the process. This is exactly what we're trying to help them with by by shortening this process and working directly with the chiefs to issue these these records and working directly with the lands commissioners and land registries to submit those records and prove that they uh, the transactions are happening. So we've um, we've basically. Uh, essentially made that process, um, uh, brought it online and made it more trustworthy by having uh, trust anchor steps along the way by creating Cardano NFTs for land rights for a particular parcel of land and then creating Cardano NFTs for the various rights you can have to that land. And those may be transferred amongst um, different rights holders. We created a, a mobile app um, so 100%, we're we're very aware of the you know the fact that most of our target audience has um, you know has has literacy issues, um, has uh, technology access issues. So we spent a lot of work. We've done a lot. We've spent uh, we had a workshop, several workshops locally in Ghana to start to gather user requirements. Um, here's a good example of that where we're surveying the land. We're talking to the local leaders about what they require from a system like this and what. You know, rather than us sitting here telling them you need you need some blockchain, we were going into the locales and asking them what can we do for you, how can we improve um, what you need your land administration without necessarily even mentioning blockchain. It's just that we're making a more trustworthy, dependable, reliable, authentic, uh, accurate system by using blockchain NFTs as the anchors for the land rights. Doing the same in Mozambique, um, and we're very happy to announce. I'll wrap it up with this: that we've um, just received a Catalyst Fund 11 grant to uh, finish working on our uh, core technology, and we're hopeful that as a part of the deliverable for that, uh, just as a little extra, is that we can actually migrate these existing uh, around 30,000 existing digital land right records already created by our partners in Mozambique, and bring those and uh, migrate those onto the Cardano platform and have 30,000 new Cardano users using Landano. Um, which may be the single largest onboarding we've seen so far. We're pretty excited about that. We've got a really great team. I'm working together with three other co-founders. We've all got our own area of expertise. Um, we've been working hard to try to get some uh, VC funding for this plan. Uh, we've got a pretty aggressive roadmap. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is just one place to start, but land rights are universal. Um, it's all around the world that this is an issue. Uh, we've chosen Sub-Saharan Africa and Ghana, Mozambique in particular, because they offer this really unique legal strategy uh, as a way for us to get a foothold and get our platform up and running. Um, that's that's about it. I think I've probably done my 10 minutes. Um, I'm, you know, I, I think 
uh, this all started as, you know, very um, kind of organically within the Cardano Catalyst community. Um, somebody proposed the idea, I responded, we formed the team. Um, and I think everybody on this call here, I've met one way or another through that same crowd and community. And we, at some point we realized that there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of us all work. It, it, first of all, this uh, dealing with real estate is a huge opportunity. There's, there's more than enough room and opportunities uh, for for our projects and and more projects in, to to enter and, and offer their own unique solution and to this kind of uh, this kind of issue and this problem. So I just wanted to say I feel really uh, grateful that you know that to be part of this Cardano community, the one that the one that where people are genuinely focused on using blockchain for social impact. And I think that's very special and different about um, our crowd. And so I think this panel is just a good representation of that. And I want to thank everybody for joining me and organizing it. And I'll, uh, I'll pass it on. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Um, I think in the interest of giving everybody equal amount of time, we'll leave any que specific questions for a project, either for you to answer in the chat, or if you feel like it's something that we need to cover, maybe in the Q&A section at the end, we can tackle it then. So yeah, feel free to jump into the chat and respond. Otherwise, I'll ask it on behalf of anybody watching live. And again, if anyone watching live has any questions, please feel free to ask them in the in the chat and I'll make sure to read them out uh, later. So then next up is Goki. Yeah, hi, Greg. Thanks, uh, thanks for hosting this webinar and thanks, Umar, and the foundation for making this opportunity uh, for us all to share more about our projects. I've been a big fan of uh, all of our uh, co-panelists work here for uh, a long time. And I think it's super interesting uh, how we're all approaching these problems uh, from a different perspective um, based on, you know, sometimes where we are in the world or just the general uh, business models. But I think um, it really speaks volumes that we're all here uh, working with the Cardano blockchain. Um, I think it says a lot about the flexibility and versatility uh, that the chain uh, has sort of built into it inherently. So um, it uh, it's always a good uh, reinforcer that we're in the right place here. Um, but with that being said, I wanted to uh, share a little bit more about uh, what we're doing at Goki and how we're approaching uh, some problems and issues in the real estate and real estate finance space. Um, let me uh, share here how um, a few slides, if you don't mind. So before we dig too far into uh, Goki and what we're doing, uh, a little bit of a primer on um, how, how things are done in the U.S. and a lot of Western countries. Um, Goki is primarily focused on the U.S. market, and we're primarily focused on um, the kind of the space around real estate finance. Uh, because the U.S. already has um, a, a sort of a, a working land registry system, we uh, fortunately don't have to tackle the issue of securing land rights. But you'll notice, I think, a common thread in all the presentations is that one of the key reasons to secure land rights is to make financing and financial products and credit products available to the owners of the property. So uh, because we don't have uh, to worry as much about uh, secure land rights in the U.S., uh, we can focus more on financial innovations in the space. So. Um, but a quick primer on how land registration works in the U.S. Uh, in the United States, we have around uh, 3,300 something counties, which are divisions of states, which are divisions of uh, the United States uh, politically. So um, it, this recording system is hundreds of years old. It's woefully outdated uh, and it has a lot of uh, problems. But um, if, if you own a, a home or a piece of property in, in the United States, your legal title to that property is recorded in an office somewhere in one of these 3,300 counties, plus or minus. Um, it's really the worst of both worlds because each, each database is highly centralized, but it also doesn't talk to other uh, of these thousands of databases around the United States. 
Um, in many cases, they're pretty insecure. They're prone to ransomware attacks. We've seen many more attacks um, recently because hackers have uh, figured out that if they can hold up millions of dollars of uh, real estate transactions uh, with an attack, then they can, you know, get their bounties pretty quickly. Um, so it's it's rife with problems. I call it kind of the the landline of of the evolution of uh, this digital uh, land title uh, registration. Um, another kind of set of concepts to keep in mind, uh, especially when you start to uh, step into the world of real estate finances, kind of what really drives real estate values. Like we've seen home and property prices really go up in, in terms of like market price. Um, but it's, it's, it's important to try to understand how financing or the availability of financing or the lack of financing can drive uh, real estate value. I mean, you, you can imagine a world where there were no mortgages or you couldn't make payments on, on your home. Um, home prices would probably be much, much lower. But uh, what drives this is uh, debt. Like much of Western society, a lot of our economy is driven by debt and credit. And um, But when you start to look at evaluating the values of properties, uh, most if you're using bank financing, uh, a lot of that is driven by uh, an appraisal, which an appraisal is a licensed individual or, or company who can uh, visit a property, do an analysis, um, and they're going to uh, evaluate the value of the property in one of three ways, typically. Uh, it's a comparable uh, type of approach to valuing a property where if, if you're looking at a house, you might be looking at several properties um, in the immediate vicinity and what they've maybe sold for in the last few months and make adjustments from there to derive a value. Uh, if you're talking about a usually more a commercial property or an income type of property, you might uh, place a value on this property based on the cash flow or income that this property produces. Um, and using a system of like cap rates and discount rates, um, you can derive a value that the market is probably willing to play or to pay for a property. Uh, another important uh, approach to valuing property is by replacement costs. So if, um, if a house um, uh, is, uh, if someone's looking at purchasing a home, you know, they, an appraiser might look at a comparable approach to valuing it, but they might also have to look at an approach where, you know, if this house were to burn down for some reason, what would the replacement cost be? Because that's a real factor you would have to look at. And so uh, this appraiser is some individual who uh, kind of blends all three approaches to uh, give an official value to provide guidance to a bank or lender. Um, and another super important concept uh, that I like to share with people is the idea of a legal title versus equitable title. So when Goki kind of came on uh, to the scene and we start talking about what we're working on, we had so many uh, people who say, well, you know, on-chain real estate in the United States is not going to be a thing because you have to get the counties to say who actually owns the property. And, you know, they're not, they're not wrong in a certain respect. But one thing they're not uh, sometimes understanding is a, a very, uh, an important legal concept called equitable title. And while le legal title is an app, is a, is a more familiar concept, which is basically saying like, whose name is on a title or deed at the uh, local county courthouse, that's the legal title holder, but there are equitable rights in, in a property estate. And a good example of this is uh, an estate, uh, a right that's created by contract. So, um, you know, let's say you're thinking about buying a home and you're, um, you make an offer to buy a, a a property and it's accepted by the legal title holder, well, then you have a contract to buy a property at a, at a certain price at a certain time. So you now have a certain type of legal right to that property and that property has value. Um, it's an asset um, and it could be a number of things. You know, it could be uh, a, a, like 
a contract to buy or sell a home. It could be a contract to buy an option to buy or sell a home. It could be a number of things. And this is where we uh, go through, Goki are really interested in how do you take these very intangible contractual rights and memorialize those on chain in a way that's secure for both buyers and sellers um, and create something that can actually open up a whole new aspect of the real estate finance uh, system. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. And it's important to keep in mind also uh, because this gives an opportunity for uh, other individuals aside from the legal title holder to build a type of equity in the property. So it's not maybe the type of equity that you're used to seeing when you're a legal title ho holder and you're looking at, you know, the amount you owe on a property versus the amount that it's worth and that looking at that as your equity. This is an equity that, you know, let's say if, if you have a contract to buy a property for $200,000 and it's worth $220,000, you can have this type of soft equity uh, asset, even though you're not necessarily the legal title holder. So that's a really interesting area uh, for us. That's uh, sort of the basis of uh, our peer-to-peer -peer financing concept that we're working on now. Um, digging in a little bit more to what we're working on today, um, three main areas, uh, an investment DAO for our community. And secondly, these peer-to-peer -peer financial contracts uh, that individual buyers and sellers can engage in. And then third, um, a really unique approach and monetary policy for our Goki token. So uh, first on the DAO, um, you know, when we came out, we were focused primarily on the peer-to-peer -peer financing type of uh, work. Uh, but our as our community grew, we had kept hearing more and more calls. Our community wanted investment uh, opportunities. And in the U.S., we have a pretty uh, interesting <laughs> uh, lack of legal clarity around certain crypto and uh, blockchain technologies. So we had to be very careful and um, uh, uh, just very cautious about how we could potentially move forward with something like that. But we've landed on a really interesting model uh, with uh, an SEC exemption uh, called the uh, Investment Club. And um, fortunately, in uh, Catalyst Fund 11, we've been funded for our first uh, funding with our partners at Clarity Protocol, who are doing uh, low-code now uh, DAO tooling uh, to allow our communities uh, to privately um, pool funds, expertise, to do various types of real estate investments. So uh, a pilot project we have uh, now fully committed uh, funding for is a property in Colorado called Goki Base Camp. And interestingly enough, we've uh, recently been speaking with Empower about uh, a separate DAO who will be a lending pool who can uh, help provide uh, loan funds to some of the work that Empower is doing in Africa. Um, so it's pretty exciting stuff and we're exciting, uh, excited that the community has funded our, uh, our Catalyst proposal to provide basically open source legal and financial and technical documentation about how we're making this happen so that any Cardano community can create their own uh, SEC compliant investment clubs on Cardano. Uh, so when it comes to, um, well, quick note on the, uh, on the DAO, we do, uh, we have about 50 members now. Uh, we're open to having 99 uh, founding members. These founding members, uh, because of their sort of brave and um, uh, curious uh, approach, uh, they, these are the explorers because we're looking at this space and this territory uh, as something that hasn't been done before. So we're kind of figuring it all out together and we're using Cardano NFTs to uh, token gate some of our private channels um, to kind of propose new ideas, uh, build communities and sub DAOs around these uh, new investment products and um, to also very importantly, uh, be the governance and voting asset uh, of these particular sub-DAOs. 
For our peer-to-peer -peer stuff, um, this is still a work in progress, but we're building a, um, a platform that is, uh, you know, it's, it has a very much a look and feel of a, a Web2 um, type of real estate website in a way, but uh, as opposed to building a website where you go out and you look for the perfect home with the perfect number of uh, bedrooms and the perfect number of uh, uh you know, garage spaces and the white picket fence. This allows you to go out and find uh, and search for properties based on the type of financing you would like to uh, try to use. So uh, initially we're starting with owner financing and uh, lease purchase types of financing. These are two uh, pretty well established types of financing um, that typically take place primarily directly between buyer and seller. Uh, you know, we talked about the concept of equity earlier, but, you know, if, you, if you're, if uh, you you know, let's say you're 70 years old and you own a, a home and you don't owe uh, any, uh, you know, it's free and clear, you don't owe any money on it, you know, you have a unique opportunity to uh, let a potential buyer pay you in uh, over time in installments. And that can uh, generate great benefits for not only a seller, but uh, a potential buyer who uh, is trying to get on the property ladder, who may not have the, the right type of credit profile to get more conventional bank funding, um, or perhaps even the property itself is not necessarily um, um, conforming to bank requirements. So, uh, we're, we think we can use the Cardano blockchain to help those types of parties uh, work more uh, securely together. Um, you know, last but not least um, is our token. So we're we're working on a unique type of approach uh, to what <laughs> someone in the community has called a stableish token, uh, but it, as as a, as opposed to being uh, um, pegged or directly backed by some type of fiat currency or a dollar. Uh, we are looking at a novel mechanism to um, link the value of the uh, Goki token to uh, publicly traded uh, housing and real estate um, market products. So uh, it's a really unique, interesting um, concept, we think. And we're doing this because, you know, in our mind, if if you're working on, you know, if you're limited to one currency that um, you wish to use to engage in real estate transactions, probably the dollar isn't the best thing because, you know, as the dollar depreciates and housing appreciates against it, it makes it very difficult to um, save for a down payment for, you know, new homeowners. And it just does a, it makes more sense to use a more modern type of currency to transact in real estate. So we're pretty excited about that concept. So stay tuned for that. We do currently have an ISPO running um, with our Goki stake pool and um, invite you all to take a look at that if, if you're interested and uh, we'll leave it there, but looking forward to uh, hearing more, um, more of your thoughts and questions and hearing from the other panelists. Thank you. Great, thanks, Craig. Yeah, there's been some good questions that have come through, so I'll, I'll park those till the end. Um, I'm going to hand over to you, Glenn, at Empower. Thanks, Craig. Um, yeah, appreciate it. Uh, and uh, yeah, kudos to to uh, all my fellow panelists, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. It's uh, as you say, it's always refreshing to see innovation and creativity at work, it, it's fantastic. Um, I think one of the challenges um, <clears throat> from Empire, so maybe just an introduction of, of Empire, maybe I can get my uh, get my screen going here. Um, uh, where am I going? Um, so while, while I'm getting that underway, I just wanted to, to, um, to let everybody know that that we dealing in Africa, we're very focused in Africa, and um, we are looking at addressing the issue of lack of housing 
in in Africa. And I think that's the um, the challenge that we're addressing. I, I now for some reason can't find the window. Brilliant. Um, I'll get there. So, so I wanted to start with, you know, we often talk about how financial systems don't work in Africa. And it's a, you know, people say, people go, yeah, systems don't work. We understand that. But I wanted to give some examples of how the financial systems do not work in Africa. And I just wanted to give three personal examples that either I've had or, or people that we are working with have had. And the first one is the transfer of funds. And uh, some of you may or may not know that we did our first pilot um, proof of concept in Mozambique, which is in Southeastern Africa. And it's one of the most climate, one of the poorest countries in the world. And it's one of the most climate impacted countries in the world. And we did our project in a city uh, of Beira, which is on the coast there. And in 2019, it was hit by a cyclone, Cyclone Idai, and 80% of the housing stock was lost. Now, for people who lose their homes, they don't just lose their homes, they lose everything. So in terms of trying to rebuild that, uh, a lot of money was promised, as is often the case when there are these emergencies, but it's very challenging for the money to flow. And just to give you an example of that, Casa Real, which is the um, building contractor that we work with um, in, in Beira, was, um, was allocated by an NGO, was allocated a, um, an amount that was paid to them from the NGO in London. Now, that amount was made available immediately and was transferred to the bank account of the developer. Now, when we talk about systems not working, the central bank of Mozambique hung on to that money for six months before it landed in the bank account of the developer. That was the time that it took to transfer from one bank account to another because it was a foreign currency transaction. So that's the first example of non-functioning financial systems that I wanted to refer to. The second one was a personal one where I was doing some work in, in Nigeria and um, I finished the work and invoiced, invoiced the, um, can everybody see that now? Yeah, I just loaded up your presentation for you, Claire. Uh, okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, okay, now don't worry, I've got it now, thanks. And um, so, so, and in, I was doing some work in Nigeria and did the work and sent the invoice to the client who signed it off, who then sent it to their bank. Again, it was a foreign currency transaction. I then received a call from the, um, from the, from the, a clerk who was in the, um, who was a clerk in the bank to say to me, they have two piles. They have two piles of, um, she's working on two piles of invoices. There is the fast pile and the slow pile. Um, and if I would like my invoice to be paid, uh, I can determine which pile that goes onto by a, a small fee that I could pay to the bank clerk. And that would determine how long it would actually take for my invoice to be paid. Now, once again, it had already been paid by the customer. This was just to get it through the bank, that there was a different pile. So when we talk about non-functioning financial services, this is what we're talking to. The third example, obviously, is the mortgage market. And that's the key one in our environment and the one that we are seeking to address. Because in a country of, uh, we've just, just come back from Kenya, in, which has a population of 55 million people, there are 27,000 mortgages in a country of 55 million people. And Kenya is one of the most functioning financial environments on the continent. Those kinds of numbers just illustrate two things. One, that the products and services that are currently being offered to the population are not fit for purpose. And that comes down to, effectively, a mortgage depends on static income on a, on a regular basis. The reality is, is in Africa, more than 80% of income is informal. And I... Again, I use it as an example of we take one of 
one of the most respected professions is a teacher. And I'm a Zimbabwean. And when the Zimbabwean uh, economy collapsed, the government stopped paying teachers. So, and so we think, well, that's, that's uh, how do people then survive? How do, if you are a teacher and you stop being paid by the government, how do you survive? And effectively what happens is they privatized it by, at the, at the fringes. So in fact, what happened was every, every teacher started charging the families that the, of the kids that they were teaching in such a way that they derived an income. Now, no mortgage system will be able to take that into account. And I think that again is one of the challenges that we need. So how do we find, how do we create a solution that, that addresses the needs of this market? And that is our fundamental challenge. And so what we are developing is a housing installment payment system that unlocks new and addressed markets, particularly for financial service providers, because they are only focused currently on the salaried employer, the salaried, salaried employee rather. So the whole objective is to say, how do we address that market, the informal market, which is effectively invisible? How do we make the invisible visible? How do we make those who are earning informally able to purchase their own home? And we do that by integrating the entire system on the blockchain. And this is the really exciting part. I'm not going to go into too much detail but for those of you who are interested, but it's really about creating a view. And again, even within our own team, we have to explain sometimes why the, block, why the blockchain is useful, why the blockchain, because people see it for the point of view of transactions and financial transactions, but not necessarily for data. And again, for the verification of data, the blockchain is, is a really important piece in what we're building here, is to be able to verify the transactions are not happening necessarily on the blockchain. Rent is not paid on the via crypto. Rent is paid in the currency, the local currency. However, that transaction is vital to record. That payment is vital to record in an immutable, immediate way that we can then provide that data back to the financial service provider in order to reduce risk. So we're integrating systems, both the old and the new, to find new ways to present financial data and financial transactions in such a way that meet the needs of this market. And, and I'm not, as I said, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on that, but, but the whole objective is what we're doing. Our mission is to move is to move the housing, which a lot of people have seen, and the view of Africa is often housing like this. And our objective is to move it to houses like this. And we are achieving this through these mechanisms, through the Cardano blockchain, through the ability to provide this kind of data to financial institutions and providing opportunities for people that never believed that they had the chance to ever own their own home because if you can't get a mortgage, there is only one way to buy it. And uh, Craig was referring to saving in US dollars. But just to give you a sense, the Nigerian, um, the Nigerian currency depreciated by 50% last year. So the cost of housing, which a lot of which is imported material has gone up to the same extent. So that ability creates fundamental challenges if you're trying to save for a home which you have to buy in cash. So to present the opportunity of rent to own installment sales that we can provide from local funders through the provision of, of new mechanisms is an exciting way to really stimulate this market and build it. And um, so we're utilizing all the sources of capital that we can. We started with the sale of NFTs. We're looking at local funding. We're speaking to Goki, Craig and the team for, for um you know, more community type of funding, but it's all around not doing it for charity. This is around doing it on financial capabilities, the ability to pay, because the one thing that people underestimate is that the people living in these conditions, they are not living free. The cost of their living, it actually costs a lot of money to be poor. And often what we find is that people have to rent the land on which they build their own tin shack. 
which when they're renting that land, that land can be between five and seven times more expensive to rent than, a, than an official house because of the fact that it's accessible, the size, et cetera. So that's per square meter measurement. So it's a, illustrates it's not a function of poverty, but a function of systems. And those are the systems that we change it at Empower. Awesome, thanks, Glenn. Uh, hopefully everyone got to see the presentation between both of us making an effort to put it up there, but uh, you know, teamwork <laughs> makes the dream work. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to move along and there's been some really great questions, but like I said, we'll kind of keep those till the end in the panel discussion and uh, hand the floor over to Common Lands. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so I wanna start by saying it's truly an honor to be here, um, not only you know with the Cardano Foundation, but also with the panelists that are laying the groundwork that's going to change the lives for billions of people. Um, we're really setting off. I saw one uh, comment about uh, a thumbs up to the Explorer uh, NFT for Goki, and that's really what we're doing here these this is a new frontier and i can't think of a better place than cardano to be building on um and we're really proud of it um so i'm darius golkar the founder of common lands um we're building uh the first protocol for community credit and i'm happy to say uh that the reason why i was attracted to common lands in the first place was the promise of banking the unbanked. And um, I'm really happy to report that as of last November, through the common land system built on Cardano, we are banking the unbanked. We now utilizing our system, which I'm about to share, have over 120 loans to people that had no access to financial services. Um, and so, that concept is a reality, um, and this is just the beginning. Glenn shared some challenges uh, with the flow of money, and I just want to highlight two, two more to really shed some light on the scale and the scope of the issues at hand here. The first is in Haiti. After the earthquake, the local land registry burned and the country's documents went with it fast forward a few months and the global community poured in billions of dollars in aid meant to help the people that were impacted by the results of the earthquake that were left homeless um, and in extreme distress to this day, that money is still locked up. The reason being is because they cannot figure out how to deploy it and who to deploy it because the documentation was all destroyed. And of course, when you have an open system and a money grab, uh, it poses a lot of challenges. The same thing is happening in Puerto Rico after the hurricane. Uh, in Africa, where we're primarily focused right now, there are billions of dollars dedicated to resolving issues on the ground. And through my partner's um, experience in real life, I've been informed that up to 80% of the money earmarked for the local populations gets eaten up by the verification process just to deliver the funds. Think about how difficult this challenge is. I mean, there's greed involved, of course, but it goes more than that because there's also really good work that's being done, but it's just hard work to do. So um, Common Lands helps solve that problem. Um, and so let me share my screen here. All right. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, so 
as I said, we've built the first protocol uh, for community credit. And the way that this ties to land is that identity and land are one and the same. And the way I like to explain it to people is that when you're born, if you're fortunate enough to have a birth certificate, um, from the moment you're born, you have GPS coordinates because every birth certificate has a location. When you are given to your parents to take home, your parents have government issued IDs, which have an address. They have GPS coordinates. When you open a bank account with your social security number, there's an address. Identity and location are interlinked. That's the founding principle of the common land system. And so we've created a protocol that allows invisible people. So we talk about 1.6 billion unbanked people in the world. How about going one step beyond that? In that those people, not only are they not unbanked, the reason why they're unbanked is because they're invisible. They have no way to prove they are who they say they are. They have no documentation. They don't have a birth certificate. They definitely don't have a passport. Um, there is no way for you and me to remotely verify someone's identity when it comes to those people. So that's the primary challenge that Common Lands is addressing, but land is key to that. And so we view identity and land as part of the same problem. Um, the, uh, the common lands technology, since we're trying to focus on, let's say blockchain and Cardano now, we're built upon DID, decentralized ID. Um, we're actually built upon uh, an open source framework called Dominium, which was funded in Catalyst, uh, Fund 7, which uh, utilized Antala, Prism. And we're firmly established in the self-sovereign identity space. And so all members or accounts or claimants on the common land system are uh, issued a DID that's secured by, the, uh, by uh, Cardano. And once our minting process unlocks to issue their DIDs uh, and their, their certificate, which also verifies land ownership, um, the verifiable credential is also put on the blockchain. All of this is done using hash without actually putting public or uh, private information on the blockchain. Um, and so... Let me just show you what the end result of a community formalization of a, um, we call it a claim chain. It's a land registry, or if you're a technologist, think of trust graph, which allows individuals to create their identities and tie it to land. So the first thing that you'll see, this is uh, this is me and this is a test uh, certificate. So if you go try to uh, verify this, it's gonna on our system, it's going to come back and, and say that it's not valid because I don't want to share real live certificates, obviously. Um, but this is what every claimant on our system that's passed a trust threshold, which we determine in a decentralized manner, and it's a community-driven process. This is what they're issued. It's a PDF document, which um, they can send digitally or they can print out holds uh, in hand. And the only thing that's required for them to actually have is the QR code because the QR code is how anyone in the world utilizing the common lands app can verify the authenticity of this information. You'll see at the bottom, there's a transaction ID, which is tied to uh, the Cardano blockchain. And in the app, when you pull and verify, you also get the hash of the documents that you can verify on chain. But what you'll see is we're attaching a face to a name, to a phone number, all been verified and supported by the community, to a right of a plot of land, in this case, owner, 
And then we have the uh, uh, plot ID, the plot status, whether it's in default, whether it's locked into a lending contract, uh, free and clear, if there are disputes, and then all of the information about how it's been verified and the plot. Now, this document itself doesn't tell you much other than it's like kind of like a passport or a certificate. Now we come to the common land system, which we're we've piloted in we're piloting right now in Uganda with Care International and their village savings and loan associations. 55 of them. We have uh, onboarded over 2,000 individuals in the last few months. And um, this is what our process looks like to actually issue these certificates. Let's dive in here so that you can get an idea of the concept. So this is bottom-up approach. Anyone permissionless can download the app and create a plot after they've created their identity by taking a photo and verifying through a one-time pin sent to SMS who they are. And then using GPS and or photos, they can create a plot and attach their status. So in this case, you see the plot is pending and there's a renter. We don't see who the person is because we're both transparent and private at the same time. Um, and you can see it says claim chain one of 150. So in order for this person to actually be issued their certificate, they have to enter into the land registry, which we call claim chain, which is a cross verification of individuals and plots. So this plot that I just showed you is able to connect with any of the plots around it. Neighbors have to recognize neighbors in our system. Um, and by the way, all of this happens on an Android app, but it, there's no requirement for an individual to have a smartphone. They just need to have a SIM card to verify a phone number. But what happens here is you can see on this plot, this owner or co-owner in this case uh, has been issued a certificate. They hold this plot free and clear, and they've been verified by three neighbors the way this cross verification happens is it requires a, a verification of information uh, between the individuals associated with the plot. So in this plot, uh, they connected with this plot over here. They must type in the phone number of an individual associated with that plot. If they can't do that, no connection gets initiated. Once that connection happens, there's a message sent to the other member on this plot. And then they must cross verify that they know the person on the other pull up by typing in their phone number and verifying their their face and their right. And then also by doing so, they're verifying that that person has that that plot. Now, we I don't have enough time to get into it. If you want to learn more, you can go to commonlands.org. Um, this map is live. You can access it. Uh, this is all real data. This isn't fake. Um, the other thing to, to know here in backing off what Landano was saying is that the, and Peter, is that these plots, what you'll notice is they're all green. There are no disputes. If there were disputes, they would show up red or yellow. The local government land ministers and chiefs are going around and resolving disputes before they place um, uh, these and register these plots. They're using it as a way to document their land decisions, which is empowering the individuals of the community um, to hold these rights since it's, it's a self-sovereign system. And once they're granted these rights and they're minted, the only way that they can be taken away from them is if they agree to relinquish them. Um, and I'm also happy to report that 42% of the claimants that you're seeing in our pilot here are women, which is a huge, huge thing we can get into in another piece, but we're talking about land right now. Um, and then the last thing is you'll see plots that are blue. 
I said that we're already delivering credit. These certificates are being used for KYC by an MFI institution. The only microfinance institution working in the region is our partner. And the only reason why they're able to work there is because of our, our technology. They're using our certificates for KYC and they're using them to lock into lending agreements. Um, and so in this case, you can see that this owner has a, an outstanding loan. Their certificate has been locked. What this means is they're not able to go to anyone else and get a loan because if they share their certificate, the person that's verifying it will see that they're already locked into uh, a contract. Um, if it goes into default, there are um, community uh, social pressure mechanisms at play here, which is the same mechanisms that uh, microfinance institutions are using um, for um, credit delivery with 95% uh, um, success rates. And so we are um, charting down a new path here and enabling last mile credit delivery all because of the security that the Cardano blockchain allows. Um, and so I'll relinquish back and happy to answer questions in the, in the Q&A. Awesome, thanks, Darius. So we had scheduled today's kind of presentations and Q and A's and moderation to be around eighty minutes. So we've got about twenty five minutes left, but I think running over was a good use of time. I'm sure everyone listening in and watching the recording will have appreciated getting a bit of a deeper dive into each of the projects. I think, in the interest of making sure, that we've got a lot of great questions from our community, and so I think it's, it only makes sense to start there. Um, and I'll run through the list from kind of top to bottom. Some have been answered in part as typed answers, but I think some of them make for some really interesting discussions. So um, maybe to start off at the top, uh, which was asked by one of the anonymous attendees, the question was around interoperability um, and whether any of the projects have already given that some thought, have made any strides in interoperability, um, especially in, in trying to facilitate a global real estate transaction. So. I'm not sure if anybody wants to put up a hand or get started. I can uh, go for that. I can start, Greg, if that's okay. Um, so, uh, DID is not is kind of an open standard, um, and because we're utilizing uh, DID and verifiable credentials, the only thing that we're putting on chain is the hash. We could, in theory, put that hash on multiple blockchains at the same time. Um, and so interoperability is when you're using cryptography and a hash system to document things is inherent. Um, and then when once interoperability becomes more mainstream in the general DeFi sense, um, w you can automatically piggyback on that. But by using did you're basically future proofing um and allowing interoperability in real time today awesome um, can, I, can i add can i add to that please um of course like i uh my professional background is I, i've worked as an archivist designing electronic record keeping systems so interoperability between systems that keep records has been kind of part of my professional focus and very much that work uh, relies on using standards and getting different projects and technology platforms to adopt the same standards. And I think, I think the, I think the question was kind of uh, asking that as far as like the projects represented here, how much interoperability exists currently. I think we're all very much have had our head down in R and D in the last year. And it's, it's really great to see all the progress being made by, by, by Empower, by Common Lands, by Goki. Um, and I think we're all kind of figuring out our technology and our requirements as we go. We're inventing a brand new world that didn't exist before. You know, we're building the plane as we're flying it. Um, but my hope and, and partly what I hope to, to provide and contribute to this whole discussion is to come back from the Landana work and going, yes, we have, you know, this is the, these are the primitives in, in, la in land rights and real estate. These are the kinds of entities we encounter. And this is a good data standard for using that. As a good example, that we base all of our own designs on existing standards. So we're, we've adopted the International Standard Organization's land administration domain model to build out our database and to, to manage our documents or records. Like Darius says, we don't actually put any of the documents and data on the blockchain. There's only 16 kilobytes per transaction on the Cardano, 
on the Cardano, Cardano blockchain. So we put hashes of documents on there, but those hashes need to resolve to trustworthy, authentic, reliable documentation packages that are comprehensive, complete, readable, usable. And those are all challenges we've addressed in the digital archive space over the years. And so that's where I'm hoping like Nano can come back and going, hey, here's here's our own standards that we're using, and we'd like to propose this as an open standard. Another good place to look at, for example, for interoperability is the NFTs itself, right? We have a very loose NFT standards, um, like the we've adopted ERC two twenty one from like Ethereum, and then everybody's kind of invented their own metadata profile to add to those. What I would like to see come out of our community here, this group here, is some kind of common understanding of like if you're going to document land rights, here's the primitives. Like let's adopt something like the land administration domain model and use that language. Let's have a common domain model we can all use. And I think that will actually drive future integration, collaboration between our projects. I mean, just listening to everybody talk today, I feel like we're all addressing like interesting parts and layers of the same problem. Like there's a little bit of overlap here and there, but for the most part, I think our projects are all complementary. So I would love the ability to see for like where you know here's a Landano land right record and you can you can prove it's on chain through this interesting through this through this standards compliant way of checking it and now we can get you Empower we can get you an Empower loan and we can get you a Goki loan and so forth right and a lot of the crossover with um, how uh, Common Lands is documenting and surveying and plotting its land again that, that would be ideal if we can share data between systems there so I, I have high hopes like that's just one of my own personal agendas as a, I, I'm trained as an archivist I'm trained to design open uh, systems that are reliable resistant future proof and the, the best way to do that is have open standards and not everybody reinvent the wheel so I, I think it's a little early days but I definitely want to keep that dialogue going amongst this community and and again what what that will do is it will make Cardano the leading L1 for real estate I mean the whole world's waking up to you know we're calling it real world assets tokenization now right that's RWA is what we're starting to hear um as everybody starts getting gearing up for the so-called next bull run in crypto and I, I would, you know, I think all of us here would want to see Cardano in the middle of the thick of that. And if we can show leadership in the real estate field, not just by like having excellent, cool project like this, but the projects actually collaborating and moving the whole industry and sector forward by proposing Web3 NFT based uh, content data standards that make our systems interoperable, it's only going to benefit all of us once again, you know, rising, uh, rising tide raises all the ships, right? So I'm very, I myself, I'm very passionate about interoperability and open standards. So I'll just end my rant there. And I, I want to say that I, I will continue to focus on that as part of uh, what we do with Landano. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. I mean, unless anyone else wants to add something to, to that question, I think we can move on. Uh, interesting question around ethical considerations in leveraging Cardano for land property rights, looking particularly in the context with historical land disputes and sensitivities. So yeah. I'm sure it's something that the panelists who in that space would have thought about, so keen to get some healthy discussion. I'll, I'm happy to answer it, but uh, if someone else wants to go first, I'll, I'll yield. Otherwise, uh, I can jump in on it. No You're takers. Ready, okay. Guys, yeah, I'll take it. So um, this is fundamental. Um, to the common land system, I imagine that uh, both, sorry, Goki, you're in the United States, so it's a little different, but I imagine for Landano and Empower, it's it's similar. Um, but common lands is an open platform, and we do not force communities to adopt our view on how land and land rights should be organized and held. So our system provides the base building blocks for the communities to self-assemble their registry and their connections and their rights based on their local customs. And they give that to each other. It's not a central body that's dictating to them how to do it, even beyond the common land system. Because it's open and permissionless, the community must all agree. And that's the benefit of the system. That's how you build trust when you're invisible, is that all of the parties must cross-reference and agree with each other. And so it's really hard not to have you know, you're you're automatically by default adopting uh, um, their customs into the system. Awesome, thanks, Darius. Uh, 
Pete Assel, that you gave a question, you gave an answer in chat. If you want to add to that, um, feel free. Sorry, Craig, I missed that. Say it again. So uh, there was a question around the ethical considerations in kind of yeah, I, I I I think ethical. When I hear that question, I think a lot about like you know um, my own privilege as far as the lottery of birth that where I was born, um, the education I've had, the social demographic, uh, you know. So I've so this idea of like somebody in my advantage position going, hey, you know, why don't you sprinkle some blockchain on your land right problems and we'll fix it for you? It's like obviously very patronizing, um, and so. I'm, I myself and our team tries to be conscious of that, uh, try to put ourselves in the shoes of our end users and, and do user centered driven design, which is again, part of the reason why we've had held workshops locally to try to get those requirements. And I think for us, um, what we are really excited about is, is that this kind of pseudo, this kind of pseudo legal space where constitutions have granted to community leaders, the right to do, uh, have this authority, but they don't necessarily have the, the tools of the record keeping systems or the software to do it with. Um, so we feel like we're we're helping them uh, claim their own power and their own rights in a better way. Like, you know, you can imagine like, you know, village of hundreds, thousands of people, you're going to, you know, if everything is done verbally, at some point, there's going to be some loss of memory or other kinds of things. And as a matter of fact, in Ghana, for example, the, the, the lands, the, the land act, actually requires communal leaders to set up something called the customary land secretariat which is kind of like a formal bureaucracy to do the land administration but nobody's doing it because nobody has the tools to do it so what we're able to do is to come and say here you go adopt land down and if you do you're you're automatically compliant now with your your customary land secretary requirements we can help you file your records and interact with the lands office but all of it is essentially is is if you want to do that like this is your power this is a tool that you can use um, and we're here as a service layer to help you claim your power. Like that's, so we're trying to do this, you know, find this balance where um, we can offer technology for people to claim their own rights and claim their own power and their own, you know, assert their own, um, their own, their own rights um, without necessarily, um, I, well, I've been, I've been involved in international development for a couple of decades. And quite often what happens is we have these top down kind of like uh, systems being dropped down to, into countries where, it's not really recognizing or meeting the people, the users at where they're at. Um, it's assuming they all have the same kind of Western North Northern uh, kind of background. So that's my answer to like, like uh, for me, uh, I, I want to not take away power from existing community leaders. I want them, I want to enhance it and give them more power as a way to, you know, to support their work and to support their mission. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Can I just also say something there? I think in empower it's in the name. It's exactly the, the philosophy and process. It's all in the name. It's what we're doing. And that's one of the joys of decentralization is that the power is at the edges. And that decentralization empowers people at the edges to make their own decisions, to create their own solutions. But we're just trying to provide tools for, for, for people to do so. Thanks, Glenn. Um, unless anyone else wants to comment on that, I'm going to move to... Uh, the next question, which was asked by Richard, um, and it was actually targeted to you, Glenn, around challenges for institutional fundraising, to try and make it a little bit more inclusive, um, because Richard had asked that you go into more detail, but I think let's make this a panel-wide discussion. Peter spoke right at the top about how do we overcome the stigma of blockchain and NFTs, and so maybe you can talk to the conversations with institutional fundraising, how that's been going, and maybe touch on how that conversation has changed or where there have been roadblocks being a blockchain or NFT based project. Maybe you want to take a stab at that and then I'll open it up to the rest of the panel if they want to talk about how they themselves are kind of, if they're coming up to any roadblocks about being blockchain based and how they're finding successful ways of overcoming that. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> and it's, a, it's a, a very valuable question. When, when we started, we were, we were very excited about the opportunity that the technology presented. Um, and, you know, we were really, really passionate about it. And, and we thought it's so obvious. This is such an obvious solution. Everybody's going to love it. Um, we found very quickly in the, in the typical kind of startup way that, that that's not the, the way. That's not it. It's not revolution, but evolution that we have to address, particularly with the financial institutions. 
So you, as we've gone along, we've literally had to remove more and more reference to the tech. The tech is actually not important. And, you know, again, it's basic fundamentals. It's basic business fundamentals. But sometimes us techies like to, we get a bit excited about it. And we get carried away with the tech. But actually, whether it's an NFT or not, it's not what's important is what does the NFT do? It's the block. It's is the blockchain important? It's not what the it's not the blockchain that's important. It's what the blockchain provides, and that conversation we fundamentally had to shift as we've gone along, and remove that kind of challenge and any stigma because you just need one. You just need one in a room, and it's really interesting because I actually had a conversation with somebody today around exactly that. The room was divided on the on the tech. So the one part is highly passionate and going, yes, this is fantastic and massive opportunity. And the other side's going, oh, don't want to touch it. Don't believe in it. You know, all of this kind of thing. And I think that's can be quite representative of communities outside of ours. So in order not to actually, in order to address that challenge before it happens, we've removed a lot of that and, and really taken away the terminology referring to the technology and focused far more on the sizzle, not the steak. And I think that's become um, an important part of, of the learning process for us, as I say, particularly when talking to financial institutions. And I think, again, to Richard, to your, to your point, what we found is when we speak like that, the institutions are far more open. And then we find saying to them, this is how we address your issues. How do we reduce your risk? How do we take away your risk? How do we take away your institutional risk? Because, for example, people perceive it as if I'm going into the market with this product, I have to offer it to everybody, which is true. You can't launch a consumer product if you're a bank to one portion of the society. It doesn't work that way. So we found ways now that we can get into that market and enable people to address it in a, in a pilot basis without having to go to, to market uh, on, on an overall basis. And that's working really well. Um, so it's really about, again, listening, understanding their, their challenges and, and putting it into their terminology, not ours. Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll add to that. Obviously, I know I'm the moderator, but also sometimes wear the Empower hat. Um, what I think has been interesting is the interest from when you do strip out the technology, how much more interest you get across the board with institutional uh, investors because they all seem to share a similar problem and if you come with addressing the problem rather than shine, the kind of big flashy shiny piece of tech then that obviously resonates and to be fair that's almost sales 101 you know rather talk to the problem that somebody needs than trying to push your product so I think once that messaging has been refined from the Empower team I think we've seen a lot more interest across everything from government backed funds large inst like financial institutions uh, pension funds, et cetera, which has been really positive to see. And also a lot more from local funding, which I think has come as a bit of a surprise. But uh, I think yeah. in the interest of moving moving this off just the Empower show, uh, I'd be interested to hear from any of the other panelists if they've managed any stigma around blockchain or NFTs, if it's something they've had to overcome, how they've tackled that problem. So I will, uh, I will also piggyback on... Um, the train and confirm that the blockchain is the least interesting thing to all of our partners. Uh, all of the, all they care about are the outcomes. And so like, for example, even, even very large uh, banks and lending institutions that I talk to, as soon as you mention blockchain and they just, their eyes go hazy. And if you, if you remove the tech, and you just say, look, this is what you can do. And by the way, it's impossible to fake or forge or commandeer the system. And that's all they need to know. Yeah. Uh, so totally on board with that. Um, in terms of the community, there was a question about how do you handle um, how do you handle like private keys and all that kind of stuff in the wallets and things. So if I could just address that, um, when you're working with these last mile communities where 80% of the people still do not even have a smartphone and most people don't even have even an email address, 
if you try to go and teach them about private keys and all this kind of stuff, you're, you've failed before you've even started. And so this concept of, you know, self-sovereign identity, web three empowerment to the people and all of this kind of stuff, decentralization, it's great. And I'm, I'm on that train, but you have to meet people where they're at and you have to deal with the realities on the ground. And I will be the first person to give people their private keys as soon as they're able to handle it. But the reality is they need a guardian and uh, common land. That's why common lands is kind of the holder and, and the gatekeeper for their certificates and their, and their private keys, everything held with encryption and every, of course, but um, yeah, it's, it's not possible. It is not possible to operate in these regions um if you're trying to lead with the technology first let me give you a real world example so i travel to rural uganda a place called omugo which is 40 minutes outside the nearest city in quotes extremely rural and i'm working with these populations and observing how they interact with the technology when one of the things that we did, so we have SMS built into our system. That's how we verify uh, phone numbers. And we were going to be relying on SMS for a lot of communications. But Uganda is one of the most expensive places to utilize SMS. It's 16 or 18 US cents per SMS. So the costs are astronomical. And as you use the common lens system, if you're relying on SMS, it's cost prohibitive. So we introduced a password system, which seems obvious to us. Let me tell you how much challenges that presented. So first of all, people do not remember passwords. They do not get it. I'm sorry. If they, they just don't get it. It's the reality. And so what did the community come up with? They came up with an idea that they were going to use the same password for everyone. <laughs> Think about that. So they were using the same password for everyone so that no one would forget. So this has obviously led us to figure out other solutions. And so one of the things that we've come up with is, and we have implemented now, is facial recognition technology. So this is just like, you need, when you're talking about technology and blockchain, you need to just forget about it and think about what will people understand and what they can use. And then when they get to a level where they can adopt it in the way that you and I think about it, then you can present it to them. But you just have it running on the background until then. Thanks, Travis. Uh, Peter, are you, would you like to add to that? Yeah, thanks. I mean, Darius just gave us a really good example of like what we're dealing with on the ground. We're seeing the same thing in our projects. And I think part of our philosophy is to kind of like, you know, again, like think about different levels and stages, pretty common in software development, right? Like different users with different capabilities. So we anticipate, you know, a land right holder may be illiterate. So they, we want them to be able to interact with the QR code, scan a QR code, bring up visual records, bring up a map. And then I think what Darius is leading towards is that, um, you know, solving the decentralized identifier, KYC, um, verifiable credential problem is not just not just in real estate, it's across crypto, right? Like if, you know, you lose your keys, you lose your wallet, you lose your stuff, I mean, it's a big problem. Yeah. And we've, we're seeing lots of development around that, like with multi-signatures and other things. Um, we in Landano very much want to lean on existing DID platforms and technology. I know, you know, Teleprism is kind of like the one of the main players in that space in a Cardano, um, but there's certainly some other ones coming out as well. And again, that's, that's another place where I, I see this this role for standardization, like let's not all reinvent the DID wheel, like the decentralized identifier wheel. Um, let's use existing protocols and standards and tools to interact. But um, the one thing I do want to say though about like yeah, so certainly like selling selling the, the solution as something like hey we're we're doing land right NFTs like that's not the pitch because that doesn't come across very well. But to come back to Glenn's earlier point, I mean there is there's it depends who you're talking to. Like if you're talking to other kinds of service providers looking for solutions, like again we were approached by our partner in Mozambique saying we've been working on land right records, but we want to bring them onto the blockchain because we want to be on the blockchain so that we can start using these DeFi instruments, so we can start using 
um, we can start figuring out some protocols where we can lend against these NFTs and so forth. So there is from solution providers, like the, the, like the crowd that's in this session, for example, I mean, we obviously all recognize the potential. And I think there is, you know, there is traditional projects that have are now looking to for exactly the problem Glenn described, like the, the, the lending practices in sub-Saharan Africa are just pre so predatory and so awful. That um, you know, if 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 we can just get you into the DeFi world and we can introduce you to lenders like Empower and Goki and other kinds of ways to fund stuff, um, we can get you better loans. We can get you and and that's the pitch. Like you know, regardless of whether it's blockchain or whatever else, but there's a place called DeFi where we can get you better financing if you if you if we come along for this ride with us and take these couple of steps here and there. And then to finish Darius's point, yeah, I think biometrics is probably the best way solution we have right now. Our partner Mozambique, for example, used fingerprints for personal identification. Um, there's currently obviously some pushback on that when Worldcoin, you know, introduced its like eye scan business. So it's an ongoing, it's a wicked problem. It's a wicked problem in the sense of quote unquote wicked problem being like one that's really tough with multiple angles and difficult to solve this idea of like in the web three blockchain space, how do you make sure you don't lose your keys? You can prove that you're, that you say who you are and make it user friendly for people that are not technology friendly it's an ongoing problem. So like, you know, that's why I'm uh, eagerly always, you know, listening to other projects, how Darius is going about solving the problem, the common lands and vice versa. There's lots to be learned. Unfortunately, we had, we had an F11 proposal to do a proper research study and, and present it as a report to the community to say, what's the status of uh, DID solutions in Cardano space. We still plan on doing that work and sharing it because I think there's a lot of, there's a lot, been a lot of tooling coming out. There's a lot of standardization coming out but it's only just now kind of like kind of settling on, you know, on something that we can say this is best practice for our, our industry. So it's a, it's a major problem, but I think, again, I feel like everybody here is in their own way, chipping away at that solution. Thanks, Peter. So look, we've just hit kind of the 80 minute mark, which is how long we've scheduled to, to have this panel discussion and presentation. I think maybe it's time to start wrapping up and a good way to do that would maybe to be to run through the panelists and, in kind of a minute or two, just give uh, an update or give kind of a vision for what you see will you, your project will be trying to achieve this year. So a bit of a, maybe not quite a roadmap, but a vision of what is what we can expect from each project in 2024. I'll go in the same order that we presented. So Lindana, Peter, I'll start with you. Cool. Yeah, no, we're just super excited to get um, Fund 11 funding to help us uh, complete our, our mainnet product. Um, we're using a low-code platform called Mendex. And so we're going to create generic plugins and components for that platform too. It has millions of developers. So we, we're open to open the door to Cardano to those developers. And that's a way for us to actually finish our software as well. And like I said, at the top of the at this session, uh, it's our hope that we can then use that same project to do a large onboarding of exist 30,000 30, plus existing line right records in Mozambique with our partners, Terra Firma. Um, and uh, and then go back, uh, we are, we're, we've been doing pilot projects in Ghana. So we will be hopefully fleshing out the solution in, in Ghana and um, getting more land uh, plots surveyed there. And then starting to open the door, looking at partners for offering DeFi opportunities to people on our platform. Uh, lots, and we're still going to be looking for external financing. We have a very aggressive global plan. We want to push this out to once we prove the solution beyond Africa, um, beyond the global South. Uh, um, so we have a pretty aggressive project plan that we're pitching to VCs as well. So we are, are also looking for VC funding that uh, within the next year that hopefully can accelerate our plan. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Um, Goki. Yeah, well, thanks again for having us. Uh, Awesome to speak with everyone. And um, yeah, for the rest of 2024, primary focus is on uh, building on the progress we've had uh, with our investment DAO so far. Uh, we'd like to uh, uh, initiate a couple of more proposals and uh, start to incorporate uh, larger and more uh, complex types of deals that you know may include uh, financing, uh, larger purchase prices and um, potentially income generating properties and, and things like that. Uh, also super excited about uh, the development and upgrades around the Goki token that I described to you earlier. But a lot of the work uh, we're going to be grinding away at is uh, does involve um, getting better at understanding our users and potential users and researching how uh, you know, how to apply UI, UX improvements 
um, to help kind of abstract away some of the things that people uh, sometimes <laughs> we assume they understand, but turns out they actually don't understand. And, uh, you know, we don't want those kind of things to be a barrier to, um, to uh, using Goki's uh, products because we do think they're important and do have uh, real world positive impact implications. Um, uh, yeah, so we'll continue working on all that and uh, working on our messaging and uh, getting to know our community better. So we'll talk to you then. Thanks, Greg. Um, Glenn, Empower? Yeah, uh, thanks, Greg. Very, uh, very excited about uh, the year ahead. We've got uh, lots bubbling under in terms of uh, extension. We've already uh, in eight countries now, in terms of working with developers across eight countries across Africa, we are seeking to pilot the funding mechanisms uh, in uh, with financial institutions, both uh, locally based and international. Um, we are busy with MOUs with some really interesting players in the space to help us take it to market. Um, and provide professional services around it. And uh, yeah, so very excited. Watch this space. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a it's gonna be a, a hell of a ride. Looking forward to it. Uh, thanks, Glenn. And then to end off common lands. Yeah, so second that Glenn, watch this space. Uh, very exciting things coming. Um, so, what to expect in 2024 from common lands. So last year we launched the pilot, which has been highly successful. Um, we have successfully um, linked village savings and loan associations cut off from the financial markets to a fi microfinance institution um, that is deploying capital. Um, not only are we doing that, we're able to provide capital at 10x cheaper rates. And I'm really happy to report that because we're utilizing the technology, the efficiencies at play have allowed us to deliver to these unbanked individuals the cheapest loans anywhere in the region including the people that all, were already banked. Um, so some really exciting stuff there. We have, uh, I just finished trainings with our uh, partners in Malawi. We're expanding to Malawi and we're going to be expanding in uh, Uganda and throughout East Africa. Um, we have a pool of organizations um, representing 1.5 million people in Malawi alone. And our goal is to onboard as many of those as we can very quickly. Um, and then we have some DeFi stuff that uh, in the pipeline that's, I think, going to be really exciting for the Cardano community. Not ready to share details about that yet. Um, but uh, yeah, this this idea of that Charles has, um, which I love, of anyone in the world being able to lend to an unbanked person or invisible person in Africa, we hope to to bring to being a reality. So um, yeah, a lot of big, big stuff coming. And I appreciate uh, being able to be part of the Cardano community. I also hope to uh, engage more with the community starting here with the, the foundation. So thank you guys. Awesome. Well, yeah, I think uh, that brings us up to the 90 minute mark. So thank you to everyone who joined live. Thanks to the panelists for their time. I think it's really great to get us all in the same space and it might be nice to set up a follow-up in six months and maybe again at the end of the year to see how we all fared. Um, hopefully market conditions are more favorable. And thanks to everyone who takes the time to listen to the recording. Uh, and yeah, for those who are starting their day, have a good day. And for those who are ending it, have a good evening.